with my team have been conducting unguiding um, candidates for the FRCS Section 2 course for the last two and a half to three years. This meeting is very special for Team Prep Medico because until this meeting, uh, me along with my team were functioning under a different brand. And this Prep Medico is a new identity which we created like last month uh, with the same team members who have been working with me for the last two years. Um, so this is our official first live meeting uh, conducted on behalf of um, uh, Prep Medico. Uh, again, this uh, taster session was initially planned only for the candidates who ever have registered for the FRCS course, which is about to start in the first week of June, um, and then as a warm-up session for the first three weeks. But then we thought, why not we open it to everyone so that everyone can come and have a feel of uh, how the section two waiver works and what is expected and basic things. And upfront, I can tell you that this the, the session today will be very, very brief, very, very superficial, just to give a taste on essence of what is expected and what um, uh, what is a section two waiver is all about, which means an overview. So what I have done is um, I have taken some 10 scenarios um to go through with you all and all 10 scenarios are very basic scenarios i'm not going to be uh taking you in depth in terms of knowledge uh, don't worry about whether you know or not but try to participate volunteer ask your queries and stuff um and uh, uh if time permits me i'm having 10 scenarios but i'm not going to be strict with the timings um and uh probably we will wind off somewhere around 9.30 in the night. So until then, whatever sessions we could do, we will do it. OK, so let me start my slides. I have some introductory slides before we start on the um, waiver per se. Let me put it on. Uh, let me... Let me share my screen. Oh, sorry. Fine. Right. So, yeah, so I have introduced about myself, and today's uh, agenda is to have some brief overview about the FRCS uh, section to exams per se, and also some scenarios in uh, general surgery. So this is our team, and this is our a logo, which I would like to share with every one of you. Um, and this is the tag under which me and my team will be working uh, from now on. And this is my team members, um, whom this is a team which was which formed almost two years back, and we have conducted um, three full courses, and each course is for three months. Um, with an excellent feedback and an excellent uh, outcome. And most of my colleagues are consultants at the moment. Few are at the level of becoming consultants. So we have a mixture of uh, uh, can meet, uh, faculties from different specialities to take care of that particular specialty uh, for the exams. So um, an overview about uh, FRCS Section 2 uh, the exam pattern first, and then I would also uh, tell you about what is expected from a candidate in the exam. So first, to know about the the pattern uh, for the JCIE and the JCFE exam. So I'm going to concentrate only on the section two. Uh, I know few of your few of the candidates here are from section one, or many haven't even planned to take up the exams yet, but. Um, so I'm going to concentrate specifically on section two of JCIE, which is the UK-based exam, and JCFE exam, which is an international FRCS. For the JCIE exams, basically, we have two parts. One is a clinical examination module, and other one is a viva, table viva, which is what we call. In the clinical examination module, you have a general surgery component and a special interest component, okay? In the general surgery component, uh, means each table will have uh, two exam candidates or two examiners who will be sitting and evaluating you. 
So one examiner will be questioning you, and the other examiner will be marking you. And in the general surgery module, you will have one long case, which is for 20 minutes, and two short cases, which is for 10 minutes each, 20 minutes. So in total, 40 minutes is the time you spend in the general surgery clinical examination module. And then you spend another 40 minutes in the special interest area, which is based on your speciality, which you choose. Now, this is different from UK and the international FRCS. In the UK, the candidates will choose their speciality, um, starting from upper GI, colorectal, HPV, transplant, endocrine, um, and breast. Um, but for the international FRCS candidates, they don't have a, a speciality uh, subjects separately. So for them, the exam is uh, predominantly uh, focused on general surgery. So for the UK candidates, you will have a special interest module where, again, you will have a long case for 20 minutes and two short cases for 10 minutes each in total 20 minutes. So this long case, OK, so until uh, the until before the COVID, actually, so all this clinical examination uh, se uh, sessions usually happen in a hospital. OK, and you will have real patients for the long case and short cases. So a candidate would be facing six patients in total before the COVID. During the COVID, what they did was they changed the entire exam pattern into scenario based where you don't have real patients at all. So when I gave my exams during uh, early 2020, um, we, I didn't have a, any uh, patients and all the short cases and long cases were discussed as just scenarios. Again, what happened in September 2022 last year, from September 2022, they brought in back. But now what they have is they bring in patients only for the long case and for the general surgery and the special interest. But the two short cases, again, you are just you will be just having scenarios. OK, and the whole exam happens only in a hotel rather than a hospital. And many times, uh, instead of a real patient for the long case, they bring in actors. OK, so this is how it happens at the moment. So each candidate will be facing two real patients or two actors, uh, which will be for the long case. And for the short cases, you'll be just having scenarios. So this will be a day one for a candidate. And going on to the day two, which is called as a VIVA examination, again, you have four tables. And each table is for 30 minutes each. And in each table, you will be having six scenarios per candidate. So Again, you have these are the four um, Viva patients where um, you, the one table one would be general surgery principles and clinical practice. And then you have emergency surgery and trauma. And then you have a separate table for your special interest subject, which is your speciality. And the fourth one is a basic principle and an interpretation of an academic paper. OK, so each of these table waivers will have will will run for 30 minutes each in that 30 minutes for example if you're sitting on the emergency surgery viva you will be having six scenarios okay and each scenario will be discussed for five minutes okay uh, and at the at the middle of the um, exam at 15 minutes you will they will have a bell which is rung for you to know that you have crossed uh, halfway through the exam similarly general surgery principles you will have six short scenarios each five minutes Special interest, again, you'll have uh, six short scenarios. Uh, and when you come to the academic paper session, the candidate will be provided with the manuscript 30 minutes prior to the session. Uh, then you'll be given adequate time for you to take some notes. And then you go into the um, exam hall. The first 15 minutes, you will be presenting your paper and critically appraising the paper. And then the next 15 minutes, you will be asked some questions on your basic sciences, again, related to your speciality. So this is how a JCIE exam happens in the um, UK. Now, going on to the international FRCS, the international FRCS, which is called JSCFE, is a bit easier than the JCIE exam, mainly because of the pattern. The biggest difference is they don't have any speciality in their exams. And the second thing is they don't have an academic paper interpretation. So this exam is considered much, much easier than the JCIE exams. So for the international candidates, you have in the clinical examination component, you will have two cases. Each case will be discussed for 30 minutes. OK, so in total an hour. And majority of the time, these patients, they are either real patients or you will have actors. And in the VIVA examination part, you will have only three tables. 
and each table is for 30 minutes and in which you will have six scenarios okay so this is the pattern of the um, section two exams for jcie and jse fe so this is the basic thing which any candidate should know how the exam happens actually now the next two slides i'm going to tell you what is expected from a candidate in an frcs section two exam okay so again here being a mixture of candidates from different countries few from uk few from international candidates so you need to be very very clear on what is expected from you and you need to tell to yourself whether you have reached that level to appear for this exam so what is expected is a knowledge of a first day consultant okay when i say first day consultant especially people who don't work in the uk so in the uk the average time required for a surgical trainee to become a consultant is approximately 10 to 12 years so on an average around 8 to 10 years of surgical experience is required in terms of knowledge okay to appear for this exam okay and the knowledge expected is if at all if you are allowed to handle a clinical situation by yourself you should have the the basic knowledge to handle that particular clinical scenario in a safe and an effective way okay so most importantly you should not do any harm to the patient that's what is expected from uh, uh, from you as a candidate and most of these exam scenarios or the vivas usually happen in a way that the discussion will be like you discussing with a colleague consultant rather than a real exam where an examiner is questioning a, an, a candidate okay so they will put up a, a, a complex scenario to you and they will assess how you argue with the examiner and come to a conclusion this is what uh, actually happens in the uh, exam okay and majority of the time they the examiners also will treat you like their own colleague okay unlike the mrcs exams where the examiner will ask you and you answer this is not like that so the the examiner will treat you like a colleague and they will help you okay so this is exactly like say you, when you are a treating physician and you have a problem you go and discuss with the physician you go discuss with the radiologist or you call your friend and discuss a clinical scenario exactly the same way the exam also runs okay so they won't put a very straightforward scenario for you to select okay this is the treatment and you go forward no so most of the scenarios will have two or three outcomes or two or three pathways through which a patient can travel and they judge how you uh, prioritize which path in which the patient has to go in that particular scenario that is what they do and the markings for a candidate is based on how you think okay what is expected is they expect a high order thinking when i say high order thinking so a candidate to meet candidate in response to a particular scenario should think of all the possibilities which could happen for example say you have a patient who has undergone a, a, a major surgery and day one patient has a decreased urine output okay or say the day one patient is having a low blood pressure okay so as a surgeon obviously we will think of okay patient is having bleeding so this could be the reason but what is expected there is you need to think uh, about the patient in a global way thinking about all the possibilities which could happen in this patient okay for example in that particular scenario uh, the response from a candidate is uh, what is expected is okay the the hypotension on day one could be of multiple reasons it could be a medical cause or a surgical cause the most common things are the surgical cause where patient could have a bleeding or low um what to say a patient could have had an mi or patient could have had a decreased um of, uh, what to say hypovolemia and things like that so what is expected is a high order thinking under global thinking the second thing what is uh, assessed is the process the process uh, at which um means the, the way you react to a scenario rather than um, telling a correct answer okay so you need to argue with the examiner in a way that what is appropriate in that particular situation so majority of the time you may not have a correct scenario or a correct um, answer for a particular scenario okay so it is basically an argument with the examiner and as I told, there is always there is no single right answer for most of the questions. And as I told, you will have a real patient from uh, from your future exams. And continuing on that, most of the scenarios are usually built from a very easy question to start with, 
and goes with goes to the last few questions which will be very very difficult so the general in general the first two or three questions is very very easy and most of you would know and you need to concentrate or you need to deliver your answers in a way that these first three or four questions um, you should utilize the opportunity to impress the exam examiner by uh, exposing your maturity your knowledge uh, on that particular field as you go through the scenarios the questions will become more and more tougher the questions will become more and more evidence based and questions will go in a way that there is no single response okay or single right answer okay and always in the FRCS exam the, the biggest problem with most of the candidates is they think that the examiner or the scenarios are twisted in a way that they are expected to tell some complex diagnosis but that is not the case in most of the things so common things are common and what they expect is a basic uh, things which you see in day-to-day -day clinical practice rather than rare clinical scenarios and rare diagnosis and although majority many of the uh, frcs exam going candidates are usually worried about the amount of evidence and the papers which they need to know about their own speciality but in my view uh, very very rarely they go into evidences or this one so although you are expected to know the basic uh, evidences and basic trials for a particular speciality but they don't dig into too much of uh, uh, trials and evidence um, to uh, score you and you will never fail because you didn't know a particular trial or not okay so if you can tag your responses with particular kind of an evidence, you will be scored more. But if you don't tag your response with an evidence, you won't be failed. Okay, so don't worry too much about the trials and evidence associated with your response. And the important thing which most of the courses around the FRC section two does is see, in my view, most of you, okay, at this point of your in your career. They all are ready to meet. They, you have an adequate knowledge to um, write this exam. Okay, so everyone has the adequate knowledge. You know what you will do in that particular scenario. But what is lacking is how do you structure the response in a particular scenario? Okay, so this exam is a very stressful exam where the scenarios will be so much in running, and each scenario, for example, in a short case, you will have a five minutes time for you to respond. In that five minutes, you should be able to go through seven or eight questions, and you need to give a response in a very structured way, showing your clinical experience, showing your knowledge, showing your maturity, like a day one consultant. So this is where practice is required, and this is what most of the courses, whether it is our course or any of the courses too, okay, we teach you or we guide you uh, what and how a response to a particular question should be made or delivered in the uh, actual exam. And most importantly, if you don't know a particular question in the real exam, you should tell, I don't know and move on. Okay. If you stay on, the time will be running. Unless the examiner pushes you, you will be finishing your five minutes with two questions and you will fail in that station. So try, it feels, I mean, at, at least I would say five to ten percent of the questions uh, in the actual exam you may not know the answer and feel free to say you don't know and move on and most importantly all the examiners are very very experienced and obviously they will uh, pinpoint very very clearly if you're bluffing or you're just you know the knowledge or not so don't bluff and uh, if you know the uh, answers try to tell if you don't know the answer you can tell something related to it in a way that the examiner will understand that you have some knowledge related to it but if you don't know that subject completely try to tell you don't know okay right so this is about the basics of the things which as a frcs uh, uh, exam appearing candidate you all should know the 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 pattern of the exam and what is expected so today what we will do is I, as i told i have 10 to 12 general surgery scenarios so i'm going to point out the candidates and i'm going to question you and we will try to restrict each scenarios to eight minutes and then we will have two minutes of uh, the discussion and feedback i request just the allocated candidate to answer the others can put your queries in your chat box or you can raise your hands and we can discuss and if possible try to keep your camera on and as i told don't worry if you don't know okay it is just uh, for you to understand and realize how exactly the exam happens all right 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Now I'm going to call the candidates and let us start. Right. So who wants to go first? OK, Ben. Right. Let me open this. I'll open my scenarios. So, so far, any queries, any questions from anyone until this moment? No? Are you clear so far? Right. OK. So, Ben. Yeah. So, you are the general surgery consultant on call. You have started working from today. OK, and you're doing your first clinic today. And you have a patient, OK, who is coming to you with an incisional hernia. OK, and patient has been referred to you for consideration of a hernia repair. OK, so you have taken all the history and you see that patient has been taking warfarin for uh, a recurrent PE in the past. OK, patient doesn't have any other comorbidities. OK, patient is fit and well. OK. How are you going to deal the situation? OK, so first thing is I want to know some basic things about them, their, their age, mm -hmm. uh, their gender. <clears throat> um, I would like to know um, early on what the operation was mm -hmm. and where it was. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no comorbidities and no mm -hmm. other medications, but um, allergies. Um, and I suppose there's something in the background, basic thing I'd like to know. If, um, if they have um, religious um, beliefs or anything, something just because of biological mesh. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so once I know what their operation is, can I know mm -hmm. that now or, or not? So this patient has had a previous laparotomy for a hysterectomy, okay, like five years back, okay, and patient didn't have any problems in the post-operative period, uh, was doing fine. And then for the last two years, patient started knowing uh, noticing a swelling in the abdominal wall in his tube <clears throat> in her previous scar. Other than that, patient, none of your questions. Patient had any problems. Patient okay. Was fine. No, yeah. cha no change in bowel habit. No, no. constipation or or um, any feeling of the hernia no. getting stuck or uh, or pain or anything like that. No. Okay. Patient is having symptoms related to this hernia. Okay. Patient is having some discomfort whenever she works. Okay. Um, and I assume it's a lower midline only, not the full. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and sorry, what age is she? 62 years. And what does she do for work? She, she says she's a housewife. Okay. 62. <laughs> yeah. So full <clears throat> history and examination, Look, looking at the scar, um, trying to determine the size of the defect. Okay. So those things are done. And you think mm -hmm. that this patient is suitable for a primary, not a primary, means a hernia, open hernia repair with mesh. That's your plan. OK, now that this is a, 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 a peculiar situation where this patient is on warfarin for a recurrent PE in the past. OK, yeah. so how are you going to manage this perioperatively? Yeah, the perioperative planning is very important, obviously, because mm -hmm. uh, warfarin is an anticoagulant and there is a mm -hmm. risk of bleeding and postoperative complications. Um, we also have to be uh, aware that uh, there's also a, a risk of patient developing uh, thromboembolic events, DVT and, and pulmonary embolus, of course, during the perioperative period if warfarin is stopped. So one of the first things I would be doing is, um, other than checking for anesthetic fitness and the surgical planning, would of course be uh, uh, discussing with her, the patient's local anticoagulation team, anticoagulation clinic, and asking for a bridging plan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we'd be asking for a bridging plan, but knowing that uh, multiple PEs uh, is likely to be um, a indication for lifelong warfarin. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my general feeling would be that they would probably come back to say uh, to stop warfarin um, and to start a, um, a um, low molecular weight okay. hep heparin so or some other scenario, heparin. In which clinical scenarios you you would consider bridging low molecular heparin for warfarin? <clears throat> Uh, it depends on the, the risk of bleeding, the magnitude of the operation, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the risk the risks of, of bleeding, as I said, versus the risk of stopping it, uh, of course. Um, the risk of stopping it would be potentially life-threatening pulmonary embolus again. Okay. Um, so I think in the instance of an incisional hernia repair, 
No, my, my question is, then yes. which clinical scenarios, apart from recurrent PE, where you will strongly consider bridging warfare in with low molecular weight heparin? Okay. So uh, immediately I'll think about metallic heart valves, mm -hmm. um, Star Edwards, um, or um, patients with other devices. Some people have ca cardiac devices, patient frame in a vale. Mm -hmm. um, uh, known inherited um, uh, from the filias. Fine, that's okay. That's fine. So, can you name some hypercoagulable conditions? Yes, um, hypercoagulable conditions uh, inherited would be protein C, protein S deficiency, um, and um, patients with grafts or in, intravascular devices, um, other conditions, um, uh, lupus, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome. Fine, that's okay. So imagine, so this patient you have decided to operate, okay, and the date of surgery for the patient is seven days from today, okay, and you have discussed with the hematologist or whoever it is, cardiologist, okay, they have suggested that given the patient has recurrent PE, this patient needs bridging. Yes. Okay. So how are you going to bridge and when will you start it and what are you going to do? Well, I, I think the specificities you, uh, it would be determined by the anticoagulation clinic, but mm -hmm. they would give you a day-by-day -day, mm -hmm. um, plan of what to do. Um, as do, you know, and, do you know what will be that plan? In general. Um, not, not necessarily. I suppose it's tailored to the patient, to the mm -hmm. patient's individual needs. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, typically, it's a weight-adjusted, low molecular weighted heparin uh, mm -hmm. with a peri period where it's, it's stopped, or, if, or for instance, some patients in the period of the period. So imagine be... the hematologists they have suggested, or the anticoagulation clinic have suggested, to follow a standard plan of bridging and to be decided by the clinicians. So you are here to decide. What are you going to decide and how are you going to do? Um, I would probably um, admit the patient the night before, uh, mm -hmm. check their INR, um, uh, make a plan to reverse it in the morning. Um, and once so the when, INR when, is... So this is an elective surgery which you're doing, mm -hmm. yeah? Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. going to ask the patient to continue warfarin until the previous day? No. Um, okay. I would stop the warfarin, assuming that the, the target is 2.5, uh, stop it three days before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so three days before, you're trying to stop it, okay? And you see, so you're stopping it. So how do you stop? You stop it, and what will you do? Well, um, the INR falls gradually, and then once it's below two for most patients, it's considered hypotherapeutic. Mm -hmm. at, at which point you'd want to bridge um, with heparin mm -hmm. um, so during that on that period. day when on the third day when you stop it patients INR was six hmm. that's what too, will you do? so that, that's too high which is exactly mm -hmm. the reason why I think anticoagulation clinics should give clear uh, plans because mm -hmm. uh, you can apply a standard to a patient and this doesn't always work mm -hmm. um, so if if it's Sorry, if you're talking about the day of surgery at six or no, the third three third day, three days prior to the operation when you want to stop the warfare, ah. on that day you check the INR and INR is six. Yeah, I mean that's that's um that's that's bad. So uh, the the warfarin should be stopped anyway because it's hypertherapeutic. We're no longer mm -hmm. necessarily worried about surgery, We're worried about the patient's got a hypertherapeutic INR and is at risk of, of spontaneous bleeding. Mm -hmm. Um that potentially is an indication to admit the patient in any case um, and uh, to 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 no uh, what what will you do so NR is six you yeah. have the surgery three days from now I, I would prob I'd probably give vitamin K orally mm -hmm. um, and bring the INR down uh, more rapidly rather than waiting for it to gradually come down so I'd, I'd, okay. I'd begin with five to ten milligrams of of, of uh, vitamin K so how comfortable are you in correcting this when the patient is not bleeding at all? I Means if this patient is obviously bleeding, you want to bring it down. Yeah. Imagine if this patient was not checked by you on that particular day, he would have been working with the INR of six. 
Yeah, sure. you don't know how many, how much, how was this INR two or three days before? Sure. You look, in, 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 rea in reality, what I would do is if someone, if I found an INR of six, mm -hmm. I would let uh, the, the uh, hematologist know, the, the regular team know, uh, because obviously this is a finding that needs to be corrected. Um, this is not something that a surgeon would be doing. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we'd be trying to enable the surgery to go ahead. At mm -hmm. this stage, if they're hypertherapeutic and they're not in a uh, and it needs to be sorting out, and that's obviously the priority. Fine. So I that's would okay. call, I'd call my colleagues. Uh, and, that's fine. And ask for so that. you told that you want to bridge with low molecular rate heparin. Okay. Yeah. At what level of INR would you would bridge it? I, um, I would bridge from uh, less than two. Okay. And so when you say bridging, you will give prophylactic dose or a therapeutic dose? Uh, typically, it's therapeutic dose. So what is the therapeutic dose of a low molecular heparin? Um, uh, um, for Clexane, it's about 150 units. Um, Imagine your patient that. is just 50, 50 kgs. 50 kgs. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a hundred, it's about 150 units per kilogram. So once per daily, per twice daily. It's once daily. Okay, fine. So imagine assuming that kidney function is normal. Okay. Imagine the same situation in an emergency setting. Okay. Yes. You have a patient on warfarin with an INR of five coming to you today with perforative peritonitis. So, and you want to do an emergency laparotomy. How are you going to sort that out? Okay. So uh, that again, I would uh, need to speak to the on-call hematologist immediately. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'd be explaining that the patient needs urgent, immediate surgery. And mm -hmm. I want the INR to be immediately reversed. Mm -hmm. um, I would, uh, be expecting to request and to get get octoplex or some mm -hmm. other prothrombin complex um, in order to immediately reverse that and get a, and get a plan. Um, okay. Your institution, unfortunately, you work in a corner of the country and you don't have octoplex or periplex. How are you going to correct it? Uh, then I would be considering fresh frozen plasma and vitamin K. Okay. So what is the dose of fresh frozen plasma you will get? Um, the, the exact um, fresh frozen plasma is, is typically well guarded by the, again, the young pool hematologist. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not sure how many pools of FFP are needed to bring. So imagine the down. hematologist is telling you that this patient needs, needs 30 milligram uh, uh, sorry, uh, 15 ml per kilogram is what is the dose the hematologist is recommending you to give it and you can operate. Okay. So, and you are thinking that you're, you did, it is at 10 o'clock in the night. Okay. And you have decided to operate at six in the morning. When will you give this FFP? I'd give it straight away. I'd, give, I'd, I'd probably give it um, pretty soon um, to. So, and we want to operate at six in the morning. Yes. So you mm -hmm. have like 10 hours gap. Uh huh. Okay. That, I suppose you have all that you like to skin at six. Um, I'd probably just ask them, to be honest. I would ask them um, based on the volume and the assumed um, action when that would begin. And I would assume it's um, around about. Four, four to six hours before the surgery that would begin. Okay, fine. So instead of warfarin, imagine this patient is taking rivaroxaban, okay, for the same recurrent yes. PE, okay? How will be your management different from the one uh, patient who is taking warfarin? Yeah, um, that's different because there is a... Um, what, what agent did you say it was? Rivaroxaban. Rivaroxaban. Um, Rivaroxaban, I think, has a reversal agent. Mm -hmm. um, well, but the bigger. How will you know? So for, for warfarin, you know that you will check with INR. Yeah. Yeah. For rivaroxaban, what do you check? Do you check INR or something else? Um, rivaroxaban, um, you can't check. There, there's no specific marker are you sure uh, um yeah but how do you correct it then so this patient patient on rivaroxaban coming this evening 
Okay, it has taken its dose this morning, and patient yeah. has perforative peritonitis. Yeah. How will you so, know that this patient is bleeding, it's procoagulable or hypocoagulable? Um, I'm not sure how you can tell how strong the river span is from a blood test. Okay, fine. So imagine you have a patient, okay, who is taking anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Okay, and this particular patient has um, undergone a Whipple operation. Okay, Whipple operation, and it's one week now. Patient is ready to go home. Okay, so you are deciding, you are checking. If you are not, as a surgeon, you are not comfortable to start the patient again on anticoagulant straight away. Okay, but at the same time, these patients are at risk of developing a clot, right atrial clot, and stroke. Are you aware of any scoring systems which can predict what is the risk of stroke in a patient with atrial fibrillation on anticoagulants? Yeah, um, I, I believe it's the CHADS2 score. Mm -hmm. um, they, there are different CHADS2 scores. Um, mm -hmm. um, there's the CHADS2 VASC score okay. also. Um, but essentially... That's, that's okay. So what is has blood score? Say again? Has blood. Has blood score. I'm not familiar with it. OK, fine. We'll stop here. OK. How did you do? Um, I would say mm, badly. Yes, you, you, you means I would say you did well, actually. It means at least for a beginner to start this one you know the one thing which i want to tell is this is exactly how the actual exam happens the, the thing is you need to understand that the, the you need to understand what is the scenario first okay the obviously the scenario is to test your knowledge on the perioperative anticoagulation management in complex patients like this and you cannot be dwelling around here and they're asking what is what my anticoagulation clinic will tell them so you can add a line but you are expected to know the knowledge on that of what is expected. Similarly, from the beginning itself, okay, from the beginning itself, you should know that given that this scenario is to test your knowledge on anticoagulation, you should not waste time asking for what surgery, what incision, uh, whether the patient is male or female. You need to tell a simple line. I would get a focused history from the patient asking for this, 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 this. And... Uh, if patient is fine, I will go ahead with surgery. Okay, so so again, that clue how you will pick up is when you ask these questions, the examiner will try to stop you now and then and tell that okay, fine, okay, fine, okay, fine. What next? Okay, then you need to understand that this is a situation where the, you are expected to go on further and manage this. Okay, yeah. so this yeah. is a very very so to others. Okay, to others, this is a very common scenario which we face in uh, the clinical practice, okay, patient on oral anticoagulants, patient um, with metallic wells and stuff. And the knowledge which is expected uh, from you guys is, which are the situations where a patient should be anticoagulated, okay, in which situation bridging therapy is needed, which situation bridging therapy is not required, and whom to contact. Obviously, like Ben told, you need to speak to the anticoagulation clinic or the hematologist to check how you stop and how you bridge okay and usually warfarin is expected to be stopped five days prior to the operation okay while all other anticoagulants rivaroxaban or epixaban or dabigadran can be stopped 48 hours prior to the operation okay and um, usually the all the novel anticoagulants can be restarted 24 to 48 hours after the operation okay and for warfarin alone, you have this bridging plan. For all others, uh, unless the patient is bleeding, you don't worry about it, and you go ahead and plan your operation. If at all, if you want to check what is the anticoagulation uh, situation when the patient is on novel anticoagulants, you need to do anti-factor 10A levels. Okay, so anti-factor 10A levels is one of the common uh, investigations which we do in various scenarios. For example, from the in the liver transplant setting, yeah. So uh, we will. Uh, so two things which we look for. One is the thromboelastogram. Okay, patient in the post uh, transplant setting, patient who is bleeding, we'll try to do thromboelastogram to see uh, what is actually lacking in the coagulation cascade, and that will allow us to pick up 
a particular product, whether it's an FFP or a cryoprecipitate or give a fibrinogen or a blood to correct the coagulation. And the other thing which we gave to check is the uh, to see whether the anticoagulation is adequate. If you want to see, for example, patient who has developed a hepatic artery thrombosis or patient who had a portal vein thrombosis. And when we are trying to therapeutically anticoagulate them, we try to see anti-factor 10A levels to see whether they are adequately anticoagulated or not. Okay, so this is the levels which you need to know. And um, yeah, so FFP usually just works for six hours. Okay, so you need to give six hours prior to the operation. And the dose of FFP is 15 milligram per kilogram. Okay, the problem with correcting FFP, I mean, correcting coagulation with FFP is you need to give a large volume of dose to correct it. Okay, with the risk of hyperolemia. And the other common things which they can ask is when you give when will you give beriplex? Okay, and when does the action of beriplex or octoplex octo octoplex start? It's just 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. You give beriplex in 15 minutes time, the INR usually gets reversed. So generally, what we tend to do is we give beriplex and transfer the patient to theater and when we and we operate. Okay. So this is what we do. Okay. Uh, this is some overview about anticoagulation in the perioperative period. Okay. Any questions? No? Okay, fine. Let us move on to the uh, next scenario. Who want to take next? Okay, Hamza Ari uh, Arabiat. Yeah? You can unmute yourself, Hamza. Yes. Right, Hamza. So again, you so you are a consultant on call, okay, and you are planning to do an hemithyroidectomy, okay, in a patient with solitary nodule thyroid, okay, and you didn't see this patient in the clinic, okay. Someone has seen the patient is in the pooled list, and you are going to operate on this patient in the next two days, okay. And you're going through the case records, and you see that patient has an implantable cardiac device. OK, patient has an implantable cardiac device. OK, you as a surgeon, what is your concerns, and how will you deal with the situation? OK, uh, first of all, I will uh, uh, check with the patients regarding the previous history of the patient and the indication for surgery, the exact indication for the surgery, and take a brief history or focused history about his performance status and his, uh, uh, if there's any uh, comorbidities and uh, his cardiac... All these uh, things are done. History. All these things are done, except for the cardiac problem for which the patient has a cardiac yes. device. Patient doesn't have any problems. So I will ask the patient if, uh, regarding his cardiac history in details and why in the indication for that uh, device, which is mostly mm -hmm. the uh, uh, pacemakers, and if, he, if he's on any anticoagulation or... Uh, 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 and the, when was the last time uh, he, he, saw, he saw his cardiologist? And I will uh, actually contact with his cardiologist for more details regarding his uh, condition and see the indication for his uh, uh, the device that he's in. Fine. So, so the patient is coming to you. You ask the patient about this cardiac device. And patient says that I am not sure about what I have. And patient just says that I had some cardiac problem three years back. And doctor said, put this. That's all she knows. How are you going to collect the information on what is it, why is it put for, and things like that? How will you know? Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, well, I think the information will be uh, by his cardiologist. I will contact the cardiologist, the previous letters. And how easy, how easy it is to speak to a cardiologist when you have a surgery in two days' time? So most probably, I Fine. will... My, uh, my, my, question, my indirect question is, is there any other way to identify or know the details of these things? I don't know. I'm sorry. What is what is an ICD passport? ICD passport. Uh, I'm not sure. I didn't okay. think six months, but so, I, I so, so in your know. in your uh, preoperative assessment, they have just put as implantable cardiac device. Okay. What are all the 
possible implantable cardiac device you are aware of? One thing you told, obviously, is pacemaker, which you told, yeah? Yeah, one of them is pacemaker, but uh, yeah. What else it I'm could be? I'm not sure with that. Though. What else it could be? I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay, let me continue with some. No, no, don't worry. Let me continue with someone else. Anyone else want to continue this? Yes, Delhi, Delhi loss. Yes, sir. What else it could be apart from pacemaker? We can't hear you, sir. No, unfortunately, we can't hear you. There is some problem with your mic, probably. Let me continue with Mahmoud Mutavia. Yes, Mahmoud. Hi. Yeah, so um, the um, other RCD device is, is the DFEPS, implantable DFEPS. OK, what else it could be? So it could be pacemaker or implantable defibrillator. What's the third one? Um, pacemaker, defibrillator. Um, um, does IVC filter fill or uh, considered one? Do you think I, Do you think IVC filter will be kept on the chest wall? No. It's, uh, no. no. Okay. okay. Fine. Right. So imagine this. So what is what is the passport which I told? Are you aware of that? Yeah, the passport is uh, is a uh, like a card given to the patient with the details of the. Uh, of the device and what it does and if it is diathermy friendly or not uh, which is the most relevant uh, thing for us as surgeons um, and of obviously the manufacturer and links to the more details about the device and contacting the company if it needs reprogramming or anything like that that's fine okay so now you have seen this password and the password says that patient is having pacemaker mm -hmm. okay and it says a particular company okay and it was uh, checked recently and everything is fine okay mm -hmm. so what are you going to do now uh, well i want to know if if it is diathermy friendly or not mm -hmm. uh, okay, so imagine that it is diathermy unfriendly it's not friendly to diathermy uh, then i will probably use harmonic or any uh, any energy device that doesn't use uh, uh, mechanical or ultrasound energy um, uh, uh, energy device do you think that you can just you can do a hemitherotectomy with this ultrasonic device, making a skin incision and going and dissecting and taking it out? Um, I can use bipolar. Mm -hmm. If if necessary, I can I can use bipolar beside the ultrasound. And have you ever done a full surgery with the bipolar forceps? Uh, well, uh, not this kind of surgery, not in neck surgery, but. Uh, the other the other option is to contact the company and uh, ask them for help to uh, un uh, to uh, uh, reprogram the device or disable the device during the surgery and return it uh, to uh, its normal activity afterwards. So, if you disable the pacemaker, what will happen to the heart? Uh, we will have to bridge with uh, with another way of pacing the heart, and one of these is transjugular, for example, transjugular uh, pacemaker. Well, I'm not sure if this will be a a good plan or not. I will have to discuss with cardiology, of course. So do you oh, think synthetics. keeping a, a transjugular pacing wires or something, is it, is it any, anywhere different from the pacemaker? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what having, uh, having the pacing, well, I'm not entirely sure. Fine, so imagine you take this patient, Okay, what what other precautions you will take when you operate on a patient with pacemaker? Uh, well, I, I need to know the function of the heart. So it's, it's, it's now a cardiac problem that I need to make sure that the preoperative team, uh, preoperative assessment and the anesthetist is aware of. Um, and if it is a very high risk, I have to possibly reconsider the decision to surgery uh, if 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 is if is very high risk for surgery and mm -hmm. 
the nodule is can be managed by any sort of uh, minimally invasive or ablation. So if at all, if at all, you you cannot operate without a diathermy. Okay, mm -hmm. how will you use diathermy in a patient with pacemaker? I will uh, change the plate, uh, the plate of the diathermy away, so probably on the right shoulder. Mm -hmm. and uh, or i will use the bipolar or i will use the diathermy in short bursts but i would leave this till the very end if i really have to and Fine. of course so, this is the so you're trying to do this operation okay with the diathermy and you're you're very careful and making short bursts okay and when you're operating patient suddenly develops arrhythmia or patient is becoming bradycardic mm -hmm. what will you do uh, well, I will uh, first of all uh, remove anything from the surgical field. Uh, okay. Probably may need to start some sort of uh, cardiac compressions if it if if the if his uh, if his uh, the patient is very. Pretty. What do you think has happened? Um, so, uh, I think the bursts of the of the electric signals of the diathermy can reprogram the uh, pacemaker yeah. and cause it to yeah. uh, move to a, a different heart rate. Or yeah. So, do you think by doing a CPR or something will change that? It will not change that, but if his heart rate is 40, 30, he's technically arrested. So, I am. My, uh, yeah. My question is, how are you going to correct this abnormally functioning pacemaker? Uh, I believe there should be a device that will be in theater to reprogram the pacemaker if it misbehaves, and this is basically why we com we contact the company before the surgery. I haven't been in a similar situation before, but this is from my um, readings and knowledge. Imagine if this is a big laparotomy which you're planning. You're planning to do a Whipple operation in a patient with uh, pacemaker. How will be your planning different from what you have told? Um, I think we will have to, uh, I mean, the diathermy will be very important. It will be mm -hmm. indispensable in this surgery. So I will ensure that uh, we have all the devices and all the programming devices uh, and one uh, actually and hopefully if an agent of the company is around who's very experienced with the device to reprogram it and deal with it um, I will have to have uh, to make the possibly the cardiology colleague or uh, and the anesthetist HDU team be aware of, of the situation that the patient is going to have a major surgery and um, the there's fine. A that that's close fine. Up. Okay. Imagine you are seeing this passport, okay, mm -hmm. and you see that the implanted device is a defibrillator. Mm -hmm. How will be your actions different or planning different? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I, th I, I remember, I, I vaguely think of uh, something related to the diathermy and the metal parts of the uh, defib in the heart but I, I, i'm not sure okay so ben you want to continue want to answer this um I, I was gonna add that uh, i'm not sure if it mentioned but instead of sort of turning it off you can turn you can put it on the the pacemaker onto asynchronous mode which is when it doesn't most pacemakers only kick in when it uh the heart rate falls below a certain level for instance 60 let's say or 50 yeah. um, and the an engineer can come typically even out of hours um, to come and a receive the history from the pacemaker and get a some degree of telemetry if there's been problems or it's uh, you know and and that infers ITU and the anesthetic team uh, but also can put it into the mode where it just does its job and it doesn't listen or hear uh, any other electrical activity um, yeah, and so it imagine keeps, and, as and the ECG will be sixty beats. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. As I told Ben, so imagine you have not changed this mode, and you thought that you will escape by doing a bipolar forceps and stuff, and you are doing. How safe is bipolar in a patient with pacemaker? Is it hundred percent guaranteed that it is not going to affect the pacemaker? I think it's uh, nothing's one hundred percent. The mm -hmm. electrical current uh, should go simply through the, your, the two metal tips of your forceps. And therefore, uh, but but if thyroid surgery is not particularly remote from the chest wall, um, so I would say it's higher risk in higher in, in the thyroid surgery. So it would probably be advisable to have pre plan this. Um, yeah. My question is: You have not 
change the mode yeah you are and you're in trouble and you are we are in trouble yeah and, and this is you a so, uh, you got to stop the surgery i think uh, personally i think you would stop the surgery and? if this is um sorry and what will you do you stop the surgery the oh. the pacemaker is running in a different way yeah. how are you going so, to stop it in emergency so in uh, my understanding is that someone in intensive care also generally has the machine that can interrogate and to to do do that stuff um with the pacemaker and put it back into a correct rhythm and i think the anest the anesthetic team can as well depends how severe the situation is if anyone anyone else stuff. knows what is the answer for this what else mm -hmm. okay sharan sharan yeah <laughs> what is the complete magnet yeah so there is a there is a magnet okay there's a pacemaker magnet which is available in the theater whenever things go wrong they you just need to place the magnet on the pacemaker that's all and that will change from synchronous to an asynchronous mode okay that's all is needed okay so ben can you add what will you do okay let me move on to sharanya probably sharanya can you continue on this so imagine if it is a defibrillator how will be your uh planning different from it being a pacemaker i think the patient before surgery can be having defibrillator pads on connecting to the system Sorry? Can, be, can have a defibrillator pads on uh, in, in case there is a problem we can give external defibrillation to the patient i know but what will you do with the defibrillator machine which is implanted we can deactivate it means we can or we should or in a case by case basis because we cannot utilize any of the energy devices in presence of defibrillation mm -hmm. so the options are either we should be activated and we can manage the, the external defibrillation by the anesthetic uh, monitoring fine you imagine if this space if this thing is basically say um, an implantable loop recorder mm -hmm. you see this uh, passport and it says that it is an implanted loop recorder for the heart what will you do I think definitely the loop record is records the electrical heart activity and it remotely transmits it. And in conditions where we have a surgical intervention, we can potentially because the heart rate is being monitored during the surgery, we can potentially turn off this loop recorder and substitute with the cardiac monitorization during the surgical procedure. All right. Okay. So we will stop here. Okay. We'll stop here with this. Okay. So again, this is a common scenario. Okay, where you have patients with implantable chest device. Okay, the step one is you need to know what is this implanted uh, chest device or a cardiac device, and you will get to know this by looking at the 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 passport which the which everyone has. That will give you very very clearly what exactly is this device, what is the name of the device, what is the battery life, when the next battery needs to be changed, when was it last seen by a cardiac phys cardiac physiologist, etc. Okay, and then the management differs upon. differs based on what implantable device they have whether it's a pacemaker or it's a defibrillator or a loop recorder okay if it is pacemaker the next question you need to know is whether the patient is dependent on pacemaker or not dependent on pacemaker okay if the patient is not dependent on pacemaker like as ben told for example patient heart beats okay only when situation very rarely when the situation goes where patient goes into bradycardia when the pacemaker comes in and for example for the last 2 years the pacemaker hasn't done much of a job then those patients are not dependent on pacemaker okay so this group of patients you can um, manage in a different way based on your surgery okay if your surgery is below your umbilic below the umbilicus okay below the umbilicus and if it's a short surgery or a, uh, it is not a massive operation okay you can keep the the diathermy pad away from the pacemaker and try you can still use diathermy in short bursts but try avoiding using diathermy and you use um your harmonic scalpel or ligature or a bipolar again there is still a risk of this pacemaker going into irregular pacing and causing arrhythmias in that situation the anesthetist will put a magnet on the pacemaker and convert the synchronous to an asynchronous mode but for any other major operations for any other major operations or uh, or uh, operations which is close to the chest for example thyroid operations or a chest wall operation or things like that you need to and for patients who are dependent on the pacemaker okay you need to convert the pacemaker from an synchronous to an asynchronous mode 
Okay, and this synchronous to asynchronous mode is usually done by a cardiac physiologist who comes and does this. And after the operation, you can change it. Okay, so this is how you deal with pacemakers. If it is a defibrillator, okay, all defibrillator, irrespective of whether they are dependent or not, needs to be switched off before your operation. And all these patients should have a pads placed on the chest wall and uh, close cardiac monitoring and def external defibrillation, if needed, needs to be planned. For implantable loop recorders, you don't need to do anything. Okay, you don't need to do anything. It is just a, mo a heart rate monitor for that. You don't need to do anything. Okay, so this is all about diathermy and this. There are plenty of other things to go into this, but which I'm not discussing now uh, because for the need of time. Any questions so far in this? Any questions? No? Just, uh, well, just one question. I mean, uh, is this a common scenario? I mean, uh... Like I never faced such a case before. Very, very. Like like there are so many patients. Exactly. Means, given that more on the, the majority of our patients are old age patients, you know, means this is one of a very common scenario in tertiary care hospitals. Okay, very, very common scenario. I would say having an implantable cardiac device. Yeah, Henry. Yeah. Henry, can you unmute Hello. yourself? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I'm just wondering how. Like, obviously, you know. Applying this to real life, it's meant to be a, a real, almost like a real life examination. How mm -hmm. much of this, as a general surgeon, we would be sort of managing ourselves? Because I, I just can't see my myself or any of my colleagues sort of, you know, working through um, options for, you know, how to manage a defibrillator. Mm -hmm. It would be something that we would hope our and anesthetic colleagues would know how to deal with, or we so get the usually. All these things are done by anesthetists. That's why you are not bothered. Okay, so we we very very commonly get these scenarios in the hospital. Okay, patient with the pacemaker coming for a hernia repair or an incarcerated hernia or coming with something as an emergency. Okay, the it is usually it is dealt by the anesthetist before the operation. They will see what is it. They will try to speak to the physiologist and they will try to arrange all these things. But of course, as a surgeon during the team brief they will raise this even if you have not seen and mm -hmm. they will uh, and you will obviously the anesthetist will discuss with you depending on the morbidity of the surgery which you're going to uh, perform okay if it is a major operation uh, you need to call the cardiac physiologist again a tertiary care hospital where you have a cardiac uh, uh, department in the hospital you have 24 by 7 service but if it's a district general hospital you may not have people coming and doing all these things okay sometimes the as been told the intensive care has those devices to try to change that but um, majority of the time you need to organize it and you have to plan it properly okay so um so some the majority of the emergency general surgery situations what they tend to tell is and most of the newer pacemakers are diathermy uh, compatible okay they don't get affected by the diathermy. most of the newer uh, things so in our era of surgeries almost most of the patient who comes with this uh, device they are all compatible for diathermies okay but you need to check whether these things are there and even if it is compatible with diathermy try to avoid uh, monopolar diathermy and try to use bipolar and try to use other devices try to keep the plate away and even if you use diathermy try to use in short press along with that every anesthetic unit irrespective of the hospital they will have this magnet pacemaker magnet even the smallest hospital will have to correct that okay good let us move on who want to answer next Amir, you want to you want to answer next? Can you un unmute yourself, please, Amir? Yes, uh, I wanted to ask about the big surgery. What's the difference of the plan? That's what you asked. Yeah, so obviously in the big surgery, it is it is impossible for you to operate with just with uh, a bipolar and a harmonic. So this patient needs the means the pacemaker uh, mode should be changed from synchronous. To an asynchronous mode when it is asynchronous okay. mode as as been told the pacemaker will work on its way okay and it is not going to affect any of your diathermy and things like that but still other yes. problems like burns can happen yeah myocardial burns can happen with these wires standing yeah. there so still you need to be careful you are not 100 percent safe but at least 
the the heart rate changes the bradycardia and stuff can be prevented by changing the mode of the pacemaker yes uh, and the other one about the what if bradycardia happens is we use the magnet that's the answer yes. or what means the magnet is magnet is used when yes. you have not changed this mode and you assumed that yeah. nothing will happen and you operate and patient ends up in bradycardia or tachycardia or whatever and do you think that it is a pacemaker problem in that situation in order to convert the mode as an emergency you put this magnet on the pacemaker okay good let us Thank move you. on amir you want to continue you want to do the uh, yeah well uh, you know it's uh, difficult for me to speak a lot i'm sitting in the lobby of uh... oh that's fine that's okay <laughs> yeah, sorry yeah that's fine. Henry, you want a deck? Can you unmute yourself, Henry? Okay. I'll give it a go. Yeah, okay. So, Henry, so you are again uh, a general surgery consultant, okay? And uh, you, you have a two-year-old boy coming to your clinic brought by the, pay, the kid's dad, okay, asking for circumcision. Okay, so how are you going to deal this? Um, am I a pediatric yeah. surgeon? Yes, you are a general surgeon who has the skills to do circumcision. Yes, the skills. circumcision. yes. Um, okay, so start with the usual uh, history examination. Um, I I suppose I would I would want to know if the what what the reason for the circumcision is. Mm -hmm. um, most sort of religious or cultural circumcisions would normally take place um, at a much younger age. You know, normally in the first few weeks or months of the child's life. So, mm -hmm. if the dad is bringing a two-year-old uh, to me, um, that would suggest that there's perhaps a medical reason for wanting the circumcision so, I so you are trying to get this history and the dad is telling that means we are means according to our religious customs we want we do circumcision for all our male kids and okay. he is asking for a non-therapeutic circumcision based on his relig religious and social belief uh okay um i mean i yeah, I, I would, um, assuming there are no safeguarding concerns, I mm -hmm. would uh, proceed with the with booking them for the procedure. So who so who is going to consent this procedure? Uh, I would consent the patient. No, but I know. It's who is going to provide the consent? Oh, okay. The <laughs> <laughs> um, so... The dad, assuming he has parental responsibility, by which I uh -huh. mean he's named on the child's birth certificate. Uh -huh. The child's mother or the legal guardian. Okay. So will you get from both the parents or one parent or how do you? I only need the consent of one parent who has okay. parental responsibility. So the patient's dad has given consent, telling that it is their belief and you need to do it as a religious thing. And you have booked the patient for surgery tomorrow, okay? Tomorrow, the patient's mom comes, okay? And she, she's yelling at you, telling that, how dare you get consent from my husband, okay? So he is a Jewish person, and I'm a Christian mom, and I, I don't believe in circumcision, and I don't want my kid to have circumcision. Okay. Um, so clearly there's a, a conflict here. Mm -hmm. um, both parents have equal rights to decide what happens to their child. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would at this point um, want to consult with um, some more of my colleagues um, and uh, perhaps even involve the hospital's um, legal team. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I mean, before it got to that stage, I would... I would like to arrange a, a meeting, uh, perhaps with both parents, mm -hmm. to speak to them and decide a whether they could both agree one way or the other whether the child should have the circumcision. So if they both say, "Okay, fine, we won't do it," then obviously that solves the problem. Okay. But so, 
So imagine you speak to the parents, and finally both the parents accept for the circumcision. Okay. Okay. Will you take up the patient straight away for circumcision, or how do you, you as a surgeon, you will be weighing the risk and the benefit of offering a non-therapeutic circumcision? What are you going to tell the patient, patient's family? Yeah, I mean, this would be one of those situations where you know documentation and and consent are very important. Mm -hmm. um, so I would want to ideally have the discussion with. Uh, a witness or a colleague of some some sort and have it all documented as to what exactly was said and, and what we agreed. Um, and on the consent form, obviously I'll make it clear that this is a, um, a non-therapeutic circumcision and, you know, the risks which would include things like, you know, infection, bleeding, um, you know, scarring, um, you know, um, difficulty passing urine okay so according to you according to you a non therapeutic circumcision performing a non non therapeutic circumcision adds risk to the patient or adds benefit to the patient um i think but i mean by definition well i, I would say it adds risk because it's non-therapeutic so you're not treating anything mm -hmm. so there's, no, there's nothing wrong with the child as they are so you're you're putting them through a surgical procedure which carries risk uh, and there's no tangible benefit attached other than it's a cultural religious requirement mm -hmm. um, but you're not actually treating uh, Fine. Well. that's okay so this is what you're going to explain the parents okay now go to a situation where the dad wants the procedure and the mom doesn't want uh right so it, it would you know it would clearly be wrong for me to proceed with the procedure where there is such um, a level of conflict it's a it's a you know a sensitive area you've got two parents who are in disagreement so as i said if agreement can't be reached at that point i would um, reach out to um, my colleagues and, and hope to have um, some sort of family meeting, um, you know, involving, um, you know, more consultant colleagues, a uh, pediatrician. Um, and no, so what, what is it? So you, so you do that, you still, you cannot make a conclusion. Who is going to make the plans or the further things? I mean, it's, 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 it, because it's a non-therapeutic procedure, there's there's no sort of best interests argument to be made. So mm -hmm. in a way, the balance, I, I think it swings back to um, the decision for us not to proceed. I, I don't see why we should proceed with a non-therapeutic procedure if both the parents cannot agree if it's going to if it's going to cause so when you so you tell this okay and the dad patient's dad is telling that this kid is going to be in our community and according to our community men without circumcision will have a problems and this is going to affect his life and the dad is telling that it, the, based on the best interest of the kid this patient this kid needs circumcision yeah that, but that's um i mean that is not a medical that's not a medical indication for circumcision. So what are you going to do? So you'll just discharge the patient? Um, I think I would, yeah. I, I think I'd be within my rights to say I'm not going to take this any further personally. Um, so this this kid, what do you think? So what if this parent... And, and, and I think and mm -hmm. it's, it's starting to ring some safeguarding alarm bells mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. actually, because, um, you know, the dad from the way you're describing things sounds a bit forceful um, and you know uh, without jumping to conclusions that that could be the surface of um, you know some some quite ugly stuff so uh, I wouldn't proceed with the procedure and I would also raise um, some safeguarding concerns Fine. that's okay so now imagine a different situation where a 10 year old boy is brought by dad and mom okay asking for circumcision okay 
And you as a surgeon, you are explaining if you're looking for it. And obviously, it is a non-therapeutic circumcision is what they need. OK? And you explain the kid also that this is what you're going to do. And the kid says that I don't want this operation. Um, again, if it's a non-therapeutic circumcision, I, I don't think there should be any resistance from any party. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. You know, if the, if the kid doesn't want it done, there's no argument to say it's in the child's best interest to have it done from a medical perspective, regardless of whatever their cultural beliefs are. That's irrelevant to our medical setting. So I wouldn't go ahead with it. And and and, and, and yeah, okay, think in a know, different way. Think in a different way. OK, imagine the kid wants this circumcision and the parents tell cells that you, they should not. You she should not have this procedure. What will you do? A 10 year old kid. OK, so you so what happens is you, you they come for a circumcision plan. OK, yeah. the parents want to want the kid to have circumcision. You explain everything yeah. and the parent says that, OK, we don't want circumcision for our kid. But the kid says that, no, I want circumcision. My friends have all yeah. circumcised, and I want circumcision. Yeah, I think that's much more straightforward because the, the, you know, I don't think the kid's old enough to the kid's not old enough to consent to a procedure like that against his parents' wishes. But, I wouldn't. But you accepted kid denying the parents' wishes, yeah? When they said no, you accepted the kid's wish. Did not. Um, I I would not accept the kid's wishes if they were denying themselves a life-saving procedure or um, something that was in their best interest. But mm -hmm. when it comes to a non-therapeutic procedure, yes, I would mm -hmm. I would take the child's concern seriously. How will you know that this kid is competent or not, has capacity or not, 10-year-old kid? What will um, make you think if this kid is making a right decision or not? I So I need to sort of brush up the Gillick competence. I think mm -hmm. they need to be 14 or above. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think a ten-year-old would pass the Gillick competence test. So mm -hmm. it's a straight, you know, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if it is a if it's a ten-year-old kid says these things, you will not listen to the kid, and you will go with the parents' decision. Uh, yes. Yeah. I would. I would not go with the kid unless I'm wrong about the age. Uh, Cut off for Gillick competence. I think it's what is so. what is IMCA? Have you ever heard about the term IMCA? Uh, is it independent um, mental yep. capacity advocate? Yeah, very good. So, who is an independent mental capacity advocate, and when will you call him? Um, I would call that would be for an adult who is unable to make a decision because they lack capacity. Mm -hmm. um, Not for disputes like this, when uh, dad and mom having disputes. No. OK, fine. So what is uh, what do you understand by the Fraser guidelines, where it is used? Fraser guidelines. Yeah, so yeah, this, this was the. Um, this was the sort of Gillick uh, case, um, and I, I think it, it refers to children consenting for treatment. So a child can't um, refuse a life-saving intervention. However, they can agree to a uh, procedure if they are judged to have Gillick competence. Yeah, that is Gillick competence, but what is Fraser guidelines? No, I'm not sure. I have to okay, fine. We'll stop here. We'll stop here. Okay. Good. So, how did you do, Henry? I think I, I quickly worked out that this had nothing to do with. No, I mean, you, you, you did well in terms of, uh, in terms of a general surgeon dealing the situation in the hospital. But the means it's not usually straightforward when it's asked in the exam. Yeah. So there are certain guidelines. Okay, which is put up surrounding the circumcision. And unfortunately, circumcision is one of a very, very common scenario you will be expecting in the FRCS exams. OK, so there are various cases. So the thing is, non-therapeutic circumcision can be done in the NHS hospital. OK, OK, 
are based on the best interest of the patient. When you think of the best interest of the patient, the best interest of the patient is not only clinical, but you also should consider social and religious belief of the kid. Okay. So when a kid is brought for a circumcision and when both the parents agree, okay, no worries, you go ahead and operate. For example, if if a, if the dad agrees and mom disagrees and things like that obviously you cannot make a decision and you need to approach court approach the court if you think that performing circumcision is on the best interest of the patient okay you need to approach a court if you think that obviously circumcision is not the one which needs to be performed obviously you can deny the thing and you can tell but if you think that this is on the best interest of the patient based on the religious and social belief also you need to approach the court okay now moving on to gillic competence okay there is no age limit for gillic competence okay even if it's a seven-year-old kid or an eight-year-old kid if the kid has the ability to receive the information process the information and deliver the information and make the decision for themselves they are considered to be gillic competent Okay, and as you rightly mentioned, uh, a gilly competence can be used only for accepting a procedure and not for denying a life saving procedure. Okay, Fraser guidelines is something which is not related to gilly competence, but it is a guidelines around the, um, the contraception, contraception advice and sexual advice, which is given for teenagers Look, again between 16 to 18 years of age. Okay. The kid has the sixteen-year-old kid has the has the um, uh, has the authority or capacity to tell um, or receive advice without uh, informing the parents. That is where the Fraser guidelines comes around the sexual advice and the contraception in the, with the teenage sex. Okay, that is Fraser guidelines. Okay, so IMCA is basically is a person who is usually attached to most of the NHS trust who is brought in when you have a patient who doesn't have a capacity to make a plan and who has not transferred the power of attorney to attorney to anyone else to make decisions on their behalf. That is when you call the IMCA. The, um, the issue of uh, religious beliefs of children, I think is a tricky one because at what age is a child just following what the parents have taught them? And yep. why should they decide that this is my own decision to follow this religion? So I think it's, it's for me, so you, it's you cannot be, I mean, at that point of time, at that point of time when you do this plan, okay, if the kid says, yes, I am interested, okay, and means I want it, and if the parents accept, yes, you go ahead. If the kid says no, as a clinician, your responsibility to assess the capacity of the kid. If you think that the kid has the capacity, then you need to give importance to the judgment of the kid. And then you should not do ideally. If you think that the kid says no, you should not do ideally uh, because this is not a life saving procedure for the kid to deny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, but any queries, any problems, you can approach court. There are plenty of cases around these things went to court where mom is a. Uh, a Christian dad is a Jewish person, kid is like this, and things like that. Okay, yeah. so there is, I mean, there is a common, it's a case which is quoted where uh, dad is Jewish, has a kid, and mom is a Christian who doesn't want a circumcision. And the, the verdict was favoring mom because the court decided that the kid is going to be with the kid, with the mom, and not with the dad. And hence, this is this, the social or the religious pressure is not going to impact on the kid's future. Yeah. Good. Any questions in this? Hamza? Uh, actually, it's not a question. Just yeah, in the beginning, I read somewhere that NHS is not funding for circumcision for religious purposes. Mm -hmm. So, but you made it clear if it's for the best of interest, then this is an indication. So exactly. Just, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So again, whenever, whenever, say, if it's a two-year-old kid brought by parents, both of them want the circumcision. You were so there is no consensus at the moment to tell whether a prophylactic circumcision is adding a risk to a patient or a benefit to a kid. We don't know. 
okay so the pro towards doing circumcision is it is for their cleanliness avoiding infection avoiding possible cancers and stuff okay but the con against having circumcision is it is an additional surgery it can cause injury bleeding this and this and this so but we don't have a consensus whether a prophylactic um circumcision is going to affect the kid okay so but yeah. you need to as a clinician you need to speak to the parents and tell these are the risks and benefits and we don't know whether it is going to uh, help the kid or make the kid suffer and then you go ahead and make a decision this is how uh, the non therapeutic circumcision is usually done okay good amir you have any questions yes uh, regard so if a two year old with, with both parents uh, agree to circumcision i can go with the circumcision that's the verdict let's say yes so if the parents yes. say yes yes after yeah. accepting the, the the risk and the benefit if they tell mm. yes you can go ahead yes the the other thing about the Fraser guidelines you said 16 years that's the yeah. age yeah. yeah okay yeah thank you thank you so much yeah. Yeah. yeah right so who wants to make the take the next scenario let us go okay mohammed yeah can you unmute yourself mohammed right mohammed so again this uh, you are in a clinic okay and you have a patient referred by a physician a gp general physician okay a 42 year old female okay who had vague abdominal pain okay and they have done an ultrasound scan which didn't show anything okay but patient is having constant abdominal pain has been referred to you for further evaluation okay so you have taken a history okay the history is unremarkable okay patient doesn't have much of a problem but constant abdominal discomfort okay and you do a blood test also all the blood tests are within normal limits okay how will you proceed from there so first of all i will um uh, assess the patient so i will ask like a thorough history about the pain uh when does it start what all done is it? all done you have to, okay. I've told everything yeah yeah and where yeah. about is the pain which quadrant this the because it, this it is, is a, a, yeah it is an upper abdominal discomfort okay okay um and it's not related to any type of food or anything no no okay so, so the next step is i'm going to um try to do some investigations basic blood tests are normal so the next step for me is uh, a ct scan uh, to ch just check if any if there is any structural abnormalities um in her uh, tummy right. what ct scan you will do uh ct uh abdomen and pelvis with uh iv and oral contrast Okay, why do you want the oral contrast? Because she's got she's got abdominal pain and I don't know what is the reason. So I just want to check the bowel and I want to Fine. check the so when you when you just ask for an IV contrast, okay, what face is included in the CT scan in general? Uh so there should be non-contrast phase mm -hmm. and the contrast phase. Yeah, what is when when I say contrast phase, there are how many there are various types of contrast phases. So when you just ask a CT abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast, what phase is given to you? What uh, are the phases the venous, of the, the venous, contrast? The venous yeah. one. So 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 for a triphasic, there is like an uncontrast arterial phase, venous phase, and delayed phase. Okay. But for the for the normal one, the one we do with IV contrast, it will be the venous phase, like non-contrast and venous. Then what is a pancreatic protocol? So pancreatic protocol is a triphasic CT scan to look at the structure of the pancreas. Uh, uh, and usually we request that if we're suspecting pancreatic cancer, we want to know uh, if this lesion, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, if, if that lesion is uh, having any relationship with the portal vein. Uh, That's fine. Uh, it's, but how is it how is it different from the triple phase which you told before so it's a triple phase dedicated to the pancreas so yeah, the cuts, how is it different the cuts, the cuts um in the in the pancreatic area is just next to each other like like the the slices are are nearer to each other to, so that they can get um a better view of the pancreas are you sure about that 
this one. So all, the, all the CT scan, when you see, they'll give a one millimeter cut and a three millimeter cuts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what is the pancreatic protocol then? Um, what I know Fine. is it's a trifasic. So you ask for a. Okay, fine. Why am I not? Okay. Let me share the screen. Yes. So what do you see here? So um, this is a single slice um, CT scan. It's um, um, it's showing. So the liver is nice. That's the that's the that's a splenic artery aneurysm. So that's that's a, a large. I'm not sure. So why 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 do you say it's a splenic artery aneurysm? So it's it's a it's a very uh, big kind of. Um, cyst just next to the spleen and attach it to the splenic artery and it has got some um contrast inside mm -hmm. um so yeah it looks it looks to me like a splenic artery aneurysm okay what will you do now so this is the c patient has had the ct scan and it's not reported yet and you see this image in your screen what will you do next patient is sitting next to you um so and all the set of bloods are normal. First of all, I will um, get a consultation from a vascular surgeon. So, or yeah, she's in the clinic at the moment. Fine. Um, and the dimension, it looks like really big one. And she's a lady. Um, so that's, that, that's definitely needs surgery, but she needs um, optimization first. So we need to discuss the benefits and risks of surgery with her. And I will need to consult one of the vascular surgeons because, ideally speaking, this should be done by. Why do you Why do you want to do a surgery in this patient? Why? Um, Imagine if this patient didn't have an abdominal pain. Yeah. Can this still be there? What is What if it is an incidental finding? With this uh, uh, kind of diameter, um, there is there is a risk of rupture. So it so needs how, how do you actually know that there's an aneurysm or something else? I am telling that this is a this is a, a vault of pancreatic necrosis within the tail of the pancreas, with the pseudo aneurysm within uh, pancreas. How will you know? Simple thing. What will you do? So when you have a CT scan in front of you in the ex means in the, in the clinic, and it's not reported, of course you'll go and discuss with the radiologist, isn't it? Yeah, mm, yes. it is very, very difficult to see with a single film, yeah, with a single picture, yeah. And, ob and unfortunately, in your FRCS exams, they'll just give one picture like this and they will ask you questions around it. So, obviously, whenever you have a CT scan, although you will tell your findings, you need to tell that I will discuss with the radiologist, okay. Yeah. So you discuss with the radiologist, okay. The radiologist says that it is a splenic artery aneurysm of four centimeter diameter. Yeah. What is the management? um so with this with this uh, large diameter the, the management is always uh, surgery um so i will start um by uh, consenting the patient about the benefits and risks of surgery um um so when you say surgery what surgery are you planning to do um Ideally speaking, that sh this patient needs splenectomy and uh, uh, splenectomy with the aneurysm, like ligation of the of the blood vessel proximal to the to the. Okay. To the Imagine instead of a four centimeter aneurysm, they are reporting it as two point three centimeter aneurysm. Will there be any difference in the management? Uh, two point three. I think the cutoff or cutoff is two, um, mm -hmm. so two point three will still need surgery um, for this lady. Yeah. Okay. So, how will you differentiate in the CT scan? Okay, whether it's a true aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm. Uh, the true the true aneurysm uh, should have like full layers of the blood vessels because it's a true aneurysm. 
but the the false aneurysm will will have only the the external like kind of um adventitia of so it, it yeah. won't contain like the 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 all uh, layers of the blood vessel that's fine imagine if this splenic artery instead of a uh, four centimeter aneurysm they're reporting it as an 1.8 centimeter pseudoneurysm what will you do yeah. so um if she is a male if she is a, she is a lady she's 42 so she is still a little bit in the childbearing period. I will ask about her. Uh, uh, her period is it still going on or not? Um, and if her period is still going on, um, then uh, she will need surgery because if she gets pregnant, that will be high risk for uh, for rupture. Okay, so instead of this splenic artery aneurysm, you do a CT scan in the same patient and they report it as two centimeter hepatic artery aneurysm. Um, I will discuss with the interventional radiologist to ask if they can uh, embolize or coil this uh, hepatic artery aneurysm. Why, why do you want to coil or embolize the hepatic artery aneurysm and not the splenic artery aneurysm? So it didn't came it didn't come to my mind when you asked me that the okay. first question. Now, now, now it came to your mind. Good. Yes. Okay. Now so now you want to change your plan. So you want to embolize the splenic artery yes. energy. Yes. So if you embolize the splenic artery, what will happen to the spleen? Um it will uh, shrink in size um and it will uh, end up with atrophy. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, is there any other way in which the spleen can still survive? Um, I don't know. Imagine you go and do, a, say, a left hemicolectomy for something, okay? Yeah. And while doing some procedure, you injure the splenic artery and the splenic artery is bleeding, okay, for some reason. And you tie up the splenic artery. Yeah. The spleen will survive or not? Um, okay, what is what is Warsaw technique, or what is the Warsaw principle of preserving the spleen? Uh, I don't know. Okay, fine. Are you aware of any guidelines around it? The 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 aneurysms and splenic artery aneurysms and these things. No. Okay, fine. We'll stop here. Okay, so good. It was a good attempt. I Means the good thing is you picked up that it's a, a, a splenic artery aneurysm first of all, which itself is very good. Okay, so there is an international vascular society guidelines on dealing with visceral artery aneurysms. Okay, so any aneurysm in the body. Okay, the first step is you need to see whether it is a true aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm. Okay, so if it is a true aneurysm, okay any true aneurysm more than two centimeters in any part of the visceral arteries except splenic artery where it is more than three centimeters okay you need intervention okay so any true aneurysm which is symptomatic or any splenic artery aneurysm which is more than three centimeters or any other visceral artery true aneurysm more than two centimeters needs intervention again all these interventions can be done uh, radiologically by doing a covered stent or coiling or whatever you embolize or whatever you want. Now, if it is a pseudoaneurysm, irrespective of the size of the pseudoaneurysm, any pseudoaneurysm needs to be intervened. There is no size criteria. Any pseudoaneurysm needs intervention. Okay. So this is how it is managed. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So even when you tie up the splenic artery, the 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 spleen can still survive through short gastric vessels okay but i'm not telling that it, the, the, the spleen will entirely survive but it is expected to survive the patient can develop some splenic infarcts or sometimes abscess in the spleen but it won't go it's less likely for it to go into gangrene or die or things like that okay that is called as a warsaw technique so for some reason you go in and do a, a, a splenic artery ligation you can still leave the spleen uh, uh, allowing it to survive through the short gastric supply. Okay, so this is how a visceral artery aneurysm is managed. Any questions? Good. 
Who wants to go next? Alia. Yeah. Can you, if possible, can you switch on your camera and unmute, if possible, or at least unmute? Yeah. OK. So, Alia, you, you, are, you are doing a clinic, OK? And you have a 35-year-old woman presenting to the clinic, OK, with a large central abdominal mass, OK? You can imagine that I am the patient, and you can ask questions from me on whatever you want. The patient is coming in front of you with a big lump in the abdomen. First of all, I will. Uh, I would like to ask the age of the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, the age is thirty-five years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, since how long he has this lump? So this lump is there for the last one and a half years. For last one and a half. Is it increasing in size or same in size since it has been? So it's it was very small to start with, but over the last like seven to eight months, it has progressed. Can you recall how it happened? Like it was gradual or yes, sudden? I, I was absolutely fine uh, until one and a half years back. And then I started looking at me having a small swelling. And then it was gradually growing. I didn't note about that. But in the last five, six months, it is rapidly growing. And I have been having some abdominal discomfort. Uh, do you remember what was the last thing that you were doing when you first time noticed the lump? I was not doing anything. I just noticed incidentally. Just noticed incidentally. Was it associated with pain? Means not in the last eight or nine months, but the last in the two, three months, I'm having some discomfort, no much pain. Okay. And uh, there was any associated symptoms other than that? Nausea, no. vomiting, no. weight no. loss? No. Hematemesis? No. Malina? Nothing no. was. And... Um, do you have any other associated lumps in the body? No. Any family history of such problem? No. No. Uh, what about your appetite? Is it good or you lost your appetite? It, or is it's it normal. I, my appetite is okay. Bowel habits? Normal. And uh, have you ever noticed any change in the color of the uh, no. skin behind the lump? No. No. Uh, have you ever noticed the consistency, how it looks like? Mm, means it is it is firm according to me and it remains same throughout yeah yeah or it remains same throughout and um, now you are having the pain is like uh, you have what type of the pain you have for the past few months means i would say it's just a discomfort it's just a discomfort and it's always there or is it related to something means i would say it's always there it's always there. Anything that aggravates the size of the lump or discomfort? No. Do you think it's relieved by anything? No. No. And uh, do you have any history of uh, unusual fever? No. No. Okay. So after asking all these questions, uh, I would like to examine the patient. Okay. Let me show the picture. Right. Yeah. Is there any previous surgical history? Oh, yes. So when I was as a kid, like 17 or 18 years old, they did a surgery in my tummy for a problem in my large intestine. But you don't remember exactly what it was? No. Uh, do you remember of taking any part of the intestine at that time? Means they told that they have removed a quite a quite amount of large intestine. Large? Uh, did they mention you clearly? It was large or small intestine? I remember it's large intestine. And did they show you? Did they check that in the laboratory? What was the result? What was I the thing? I am not sure. Means the the doctors checked that and they told me to come and check. Um, I did some scans for six months after the surgery, and I had some camera tests from the back. Uh, mm -hmm. After that, I felt fine, so I self-discharged. So I've never met any of the doctors in the last 10 years. Did they advise you to go for any further treatment after the results of the... No, they told I'm fine. No, they did not ask you to go for any chemotherapy. No. no. 
and uh, what what was the problem uh, when you went for the surgery do you remember means i i had some blood in my stools and they did some camera test and then they told it needs to be removed so they removed they removed it and uh, um, do you remember how far was the history at that time means i'm not sure about that yeah. and uh, there was any associated weight loss or no no and uh, you, you just went to the emergency or it was something going on for quite a number of days uh, i don't know madam i don't know you don't know okay so after uh, i will still examine the patient vitals and then i will examine the, uh, i will go for what the do you what do you think this patient has just on inspection incisional hernia probably mm -hmm. okay so what all you will test First of all, I'll go for uh, vital signs. We'll check for That's signs. Fine. Of Let's just tell about the abdominal examination. Abdominal examination. First of all, I'll uh, have the proper exposure from nipple mm -hmm. to mid, -thigh. and then I'll mm -hmm. stand at the bed end of the patient, and then mm -hmm. um, I will ask the patient to cough, and I'll see any associated increase in the size of the swelling or not. Then I will ask the patient to lift up uh, his head so that I can fine. see. So you you try to see these things, okay? And you see that this this swelling is firm. it is not reducing and there is no cough impulse there is no cough impulse okay then i'll ask the patient whether he has pain or not and i will go ahead with the palpation of the uh, yeah so you palpate it and you see that it is a firm swelling no cough impulse felt and it's not reducible it's not re even when the patient is lifting up the head yeah no it's not reducible and i'll go for um, fluid trail shifting dullness then auscultation of bowel sounds and then i will go to examine the associated lymphadenopathy and all normal that, there is no free fluid bowel sounds normal no lymphadenopathy then i will do a pr examination no findings normal fine and um, i would i will also examine the swelling itself uh, consistency margins and yeah uh, as i told it's a firm mass mm -hmm. the margins are like it's not well defined mm -hmm. yeah not reducible no cough impulse felt i what do you think is a differential diagnosis at this point uh it could be a it still it can be a, an irreducible uh, incisional hernia mm -hmm. it be a desmoid tumor it can be a, a mass uh, mm -hmm. whether associated with the layers of the abdomen or it can right. be so what would you like to do next after i examined all that i will go for a ct scan of the abdomen this is the ct okay it shows what is the ct scan first of all contrast enhanced abdominal scan okay contrast yeah that's fine is it with iv contrast oral contrast rectal contrast uh we can give all of them iv oral and rectal now what was given in this case is what i'm telling in this case is given um, a ct scan with oral contrast oral and iv okay what do you see here i see here there is a mass apparently looks like it's uh, in the muscular wall of the abdominal cavity mm -hmm. it uh, looks well defined homogeneous mm -hmm. and uh, apparently if there is no enhancement of the uh, mass and mm -hmm. the peritoneum is intact so mm -hmm. it's not hernia but it is only the one cut so definitely i would like to see the entire film and uh, i will discuss with the radiologist yeah so what do you think is this it could be a desmoid tumor mm -hmm. and uh, okay so you you went and discuss with the radiologist okay as mm -hmm. you told the radiologist say said that it is a well circumscribed lesion in the abdominal wall and the differential diagnosis includes a hematoma a lipoma a desmoid tumor mm -hmm. hematoma would be unlikely in this case i will say because there is no recent history of trauma mm -hmm. and it's there for quite a number of years 
and similarly i will not uh, think the clinical scenario doesn't go with the lipoma also because it uh, the consistency doesn't go in the favor and it's uh, not reducible also like mm-hmm. uh, i i'll still think more in the favor of desmoid tumor okay what will you do next uh for the desmoid tumor i'll ask the um, uh, other history because specifically he gave the history that he had uh, some pathology when he was a child so mm-hmm. just rule out uh, what what pathology so can... you think would have happened if it is a desmoid tumor uh gardner syndrome like uh, associated what is gardner co- syndrome it's uh, uh, adenomatous polyposis coli uh, with the uh, uh you know desmoids and dermoid skin tumors along with the mm-hmm. colonic okay good so how do you what is desmoid tumor desmoid tumor is actually it is a benign tumor that uh, mm-hmm. originates from the mesenchymal tissues mm-hmm. and uh, it is usually associated with uh, with Fine. gardner so- so you are suspecting a desmoid tumor in this case so what will you do next to confirm it if uh, i'll not find any clue regarding the previous histopathology mm. or uh, whether this is a polyposis syndrome or not uh, mm-hmm. i'll go for a biopsy image guided biopsy what biopsy do you do fna true cut bitch h true cut biopsy okay and what do you see if it is a, a, a desmoid tumor in if a true cut biopsy is- uh what i will see in the desmoid tumor uh mesenchymal cells mm-hmm. and uh, i don't remember the exactly immune histochemistry Fine. so you 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 see the histopathology and they have said that there is a fibroblast proliferation suggestive of desmoid tumor okay mm-hmm. so what is the treatment for desmoid tumor actually if the desmoid tumor is small and it's not symptomatic we usually don't go for excision but mm-hmm. if it is symptomatic or it's causing trouble for the patient then we will go for excision what other management options are available apart from observation and surgery apart from observation. is your kid okay is your kid or someone yeah yeah <laughs> so okay hmm. what other options <laughs> radiotherapy mhm anything else i'm not sure whether we can do any hormonal therapy you are aware of for desmoid tumor i'm not sure but maybe these new monoclonal antibodies mhm any role of any hormones for desmoid okay fine we'll I'm stop not... here we'll mm-hmm. stop here okay yeah. good you did very well actually you did very well you, your history was complete your clinical examination was fine you at least thought about desmoid yeah which is very good so all good yeah i i have no comments to make are you are you giving exams uh, this year or what is your when are you giving the exam i am planning to give part 1 in october yeah oh that's good that's yeah. good well prepared good right let me move on any any questions in this this point but you did not tell me about hormonal therapy and uh, tamoxifen can be given tamoxifen can be you given. can give tamoxifen you can give um, um the uh, what is that we give uh, monoclonal antibodies yeah which we can mm-hmm. be given yeah good how tamoxifen uh, acts to like downgrade Means the factor it 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 means the desmoid tumors are considered to have uh, estrogen receptors and tamoxifen helps in uh, pr- progression of the desmoid tumor mm-hmm. okay. okay yeah no, okay. good mm-hmm. thank you thank you thank you so who wants to go next so anyone who has not done so far let me pick them up uh, i've got a quick question if yes. that's okay Yes. Uh, so it's it's regarding the previous scenario rather than this one. You didn't mm-hmm. tell us the pancreatic protocol. So what is the difference between the pancreatic? Okay. Yeah, protocol? fine. So in the CT scan there are various protocols, okay? From the time you give the contrast and from the time it reaches so the, the initial phase is a non-contrast CT and the last one is a delayed phase. The actual delayed phase we call it is basically a urogram. 
where the in mean, which is 15 minutes after giving contrast where you see the contrast in the kidney ureter and the bladder so in between the non-contrast film and the delayed phase, you have multiple other phases, which includes early arterial phase. Then we have an arterial phase. And then we have a portal phase. Sorry, early arterial, arterial, and then we have a pancreatic arterial phase. OK, and then we have a portal venous phase. And then we have a venous phase. And then we have a delayed phase. So. All these phases are basically based on the time between the time where the contrast is given and the image is acquired. Okay, so if it's an early arterial phase, it's something like 15 to 30 seconds. If it's an arterial phase, it is like 25 to 35 seconds. If it's a pancreatic arterial phase, that's a different timing. So when you ask specifically for certain protocols, for example, if you want to assess the SOL in the liver, okay. So any space occupying lesion in the liver, we tend to do an early arterial phase and a portal venous phase. Okay. When we want to do, uh, if you if you say uh, just a CT with IV contrast, okay, the CT which usually taken is a CT which is in the venous phase. That's what they take. Okay. And if you want to do a pancreatic protocol, we will have a non-contrast CT and a pancreatic arterial phase and a portal venous phase. So this is the difference. It's not based on the, the millimeter of slices which we make on the uh, images. OK? Good. OK. So for the want of time, I'm going to restrict with one more scenario and stop. Let me find a good scenario which will be good. Uh, fine. OK, fine. Uh, so who wants to go next? Which uh, means I want someone who has not answered. Anil Kumar, you want to go? You want to answer? OK, he's not unmuting also. Anyone else? Um, uh, no, I want someone who has not answered. Apart from Ahmed Adam, you want to do? No? Who else is here? OK, fine. Let me OK, let me go with whoever has responded. So let me go with uh, uh, Hamza. You want to go? Yes. So Hamza, so you can you unmute yourself, please? I want to try my luck again. No, absolutely. Don't worry. So <laughs> you have a patient, OK, so who was under your care, OK, who had severe necrotizing pancreatitis, OK? So patient was in ITU for almost a month, OK? And then was managed in the ward and got discharged, OK? Mm -hmm. The patient didn't have any interventions, but had a very stormy ITU period, OK? The patient somehow recovered, went back home, comes after three months to your clinic for a general review, OK? So what all things you will, what information you want to get from the patient? So uh, first of all, I need to, uh, uh, to go through uh, thorough history of the patients and the exact management that he had. Uh, what about if he had uh, infected necrotic uh, pancreatitis or necrotic pancreatitis? If, there's, if he had any complication of the pancreatitis she had and why he's been there for one month. I need to know exactly the, his management plan regarding what is the type of complication he had. The finding of a review so all patient, the findings. Patient, the patient, 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 although had some problems with the collection and stuff, he didn't have any drainage done. Okay, patient had mm -hmm. some, and I said necrotizing pancreatitis, patient had pancreatic necrosis. Okay, and patient had bad infections, which was all treated. And coming today, patient is coming for a clinic review. What all the specific things you want to get to know from the patient? Uh, but he did get the treat without intervention? Yes, without, without intervention. OK, so I will uh, uh, do some uh, uh, if he, uh, follow up in form if he has any new symptoms, any mm -hmm. uh, new symptoms regarding her uh, abdominal pain or any symptoms. I will also do another, uh, do, uh, another scanning if he has any uh, solicit uh, form. Before you proceed to the scan, you want to ask any questions to the patient? Um, what questions do you want to ask? I want to ask if he has 
if he has any in, uh, regarding his uh, new symptoms, if he has any new symptoms at all, if, or if he okay, so condition. patient says that patient says that I've been having uh, uh, a crampy abdominal pain now and then. Mm -hmm. So patients still have symptoms, and uh, uh, I will investigate the symptoms for further. I Sorry? will uh, I will investigate the symptoms further. So I need mm -hmm. to uh, uh, take also thorough history from this uh, just pain and uh, yeah. exactly the type of the pain. Do what are the like what are the causes of a crampy abdominal pain in a patient three months post severe pancreatitis? Uh, it could be a sort of cyst, uh, uh, as a complication of uh, pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. It could be, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the most common actual complication. Uh, but I will also uh, rule out any other complication of the pancreatitis. Any like? uh, fluid, so the uh, world of necrosis, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sterile fluid collection or uh, infected fluid collection. Fine. So, what do what would you like to do now? I will uh, request uh, uh, abdominal CT with IV contrast after checking yes. his uh, kidney function test. Then. So, you, you just blood. want to do a kidney function test, or you want to do all the blood tests? No, I will do all the blood tests. I will also uh, request a, a full uh, uh, blood test and chemistry, uh, and also pancreatic enzymes. Will also look, uh, uh, yeah. Fine. So you do, you, do, you do the routine bloods, okay? And you see that patient's platelet count is more than 1,000. Mm -hmm. So what uh, thrombocytosis, so thrombocytosis is uh, uh, also a sign of uh, septic response. Mm -hmm. So Anything uh, else? Anything else? Patient is not septic. Patient doesn't have any fever, nothing. Mm -hmm. What else could be the reason for thrombocytosis in this clinical scenario? Uh, I'm not sure, sorry. Okay. What else do you want to look for in the blood test in a patient like this? We'll uh, look to the uh, inflammatory markers and also uh, look for any uh, tumor markers uh, as this patient has uh, recurrent history. It could be uh, underlying malignancy. Okay, so how, how common it is patient with acute pancreatitis developing cancer within three months or two months? Uh, can you repeat the game, please? No, how common it is a patient who got recently admitted two months back, obviously you would have done multiple scans which then pick up a cancer for him to develop a cancer now within two months. Uh, it's unlikely, uh, but okay. I'm, uh, I'm in the form, yeah. Of if Fine. I'm, if so it. you have done a CT scan, and this is what you see. Okay. So this is uh, a slice of uh, an abdominal CT with a big contrast showed. Uh, I actually I need to discuss this with the radiologist and also look to the other slice of this axial. But what uh, do you CT see CT. first? Obviously, you as a surgeon, you need to find I, something in a CT before you speak to the radiologist. Yes. Exactly. Uh, I will, uh, I, as uh, obviously here, there is uh, uh, an abnormal uh, abnormality uh, in the pancreas. Uh, there is a fat stranding along with uh, some fluid collection involving what the pancreas. Is, what, is, what do you see in the pancreas? I think there is, uh, uh, I think there could be, uh, there is a fluid collection. Most mm -hmm. likely it's a pseudocyst. Mm -hmm. So when will you call a collection in the pancreas a pseudocyst? I am telling that it is an acute peripancreatic collection, secondary to inflammation. I am telling it's not pseudocyst. When will you call a collection as a pseudocyst? Uh, a pseudocyst is uh, when you have uh, 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 non-granulation will define capsule. Uh, but how do you know that with the CT scan? You you won't, but based mostly on the uh, uh, the duration. The patient is three months, so most likely uh, it's a pseudo cyst, not an acute so fluid collection. When, what is the the Four cutoff weeks. duration? Sorry? Four weeks. Four weeks, exactly. So how will you know that this is a pseudo cyst and not world of pancreatic necrosis? Uh, actually, the content of the, uh, there is no solid content uh, in the uh, CT scan. 
which if there's any solid content, I will think of how, more. How comfortable are you telling that this is system not solid in the CT scan? This one. Uh, actually, um, uh, uh, that's also, I will be more comfortable discussing this with the radiologist and take all the uh, picture and all the sliding skills to, to make Fine. sure. Fine. So what is the best investigation of choice to differentiate a pseudocyst from world of pancreatic necrosis? Uh, you will go for MRI scan. Mm -hmm. OK, fine. So the here. MRI says that it is a world of pancreatic necrosis. OK, mm -hmm. so so the patient's presenting problem at this point is crampy abdominal pain. Can this world of pancreatic necrosis explain that pain or do you want to think of any other cause of pain? So uh, uh, world of uh, necrosis uh, is one actually of the cause pain, but I think also in the CT there is another abnormalities mm -hmm. uh, behind the, uh, can I see again, please, the CT? There is something behind the spleen. Okay, let me share again. Yeah. So that uh, area behind the left kidney, there's some mm -hmm. collection here behind the left yeah. kidney, which could yeah. suggest another pathology. So we need mm -hmm. it to be rolled out and investigated further. That's fine. So apart from this world of pancreatic necrosis or a pseudocyst causing this pain, what is the common reason for this crampy abdominal pain in a post-severe pancreatitis patient? Uh, it could be uh, it could be like a uh, splenic pathology because of uh... okay anything else what are all the metabolic complications following severe pancreatitis so uh, it could be uh, due to recurrent vomiting and the gastric outlet obstruction can, can cause gastric outlet obstruction, can cause uh, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Okay, what else? What are the common things that you look for when the pancreas is dead? Acidosis. Anything else? What, what will happen when the pancreas fails to produce exocrine and then secretions? So if patient is uh, failed to uh, proper uh, functioning, it will develop, but it's not early, it will develop like diabetes, steatoria, uh, vitamin deficiency in the mm -hmm. form of uh, lipid soluble vitamin deficiency. Okay, AD, so, so what will be the symptoms in a patient who develops, who has developed steatoria? Steatoria, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's this uh, malabsorption. Yeah, it will be mal malabsorption of vitamin, uh, of vitamin, more mainly lipid soluble vitamin. So he will be the form of uh, uh, like uh, vitamin K deficiency. So if, if I ask you to check if the patient has steatoria or not, will you be asking the vitamin K deficiencies and stuff, or what else you ask? Fecoelastase. I mean, you blood test check fecoelastase. No, but this you, you need. You will ask about symptoms first, right? So how, yeah. what is the typical symptom in a patient with steatoria? How will the stools so there look? Is a foul smelling stools, uh, uh, greasy stools. Yeah. Uh, that will yeah, make it more likely. Fine. So how will you confirm that this patient has steatoria or not? Uh, a fecoelastase uh, test and... Uh, uh, Fine. So the fecal elastase should be high or low for a steatoria? should be less than 7, 17. Mm -hmm. OK. So imagine the fecal elastase levels are low and the diagnosis is made as steatoria. So how will you treat steatoria? So mainly uh, uh, supportive treatment, symptomatic treatments, and like? uh, maybe treat the underlying cause. What so, will you do for the underlying cause? Will you give a pancreas transplant or islet cell transplant? There is a failed <laughs> pancreas, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. So I will liaise with the critical care team. <laughs> what else you could do? What else you could do for a steatoria? 
Uh, I will give the vitamins and replace all the losses in the form of IV fluids and chickens. So the... why, why is seatoria happening? It's because the pancreas doesn't secrete the fat digesting the... hormones, yeah. isn't it? So what, you, what can you give then? You can give pancreatic enzyme supplements. Enzymes, I want to say that. You want yeah. to say that. Okay, fine. So you need to give pancreatic enzyme supplements. Okay. Are you aware of yeah. any names? Which we commonly use? No, I'm sorry. I know, but I did forget now. <laughs> okay, fine. Right. Creon. Yeah. Creon is one of the tab common tablets which we use for uh, mm -hmm. steatoria. Yeah. So again, mm -hmm. Creon, again, that, there are a lot of questions which comes after that. So Creon is entry coated. Where will you use entry coated pancreatic supplements? Where will you use uh, non entry coated pancreatic supplements? What pancreatic supplements you use for chronic pancreatitis with pain? So that's 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 the follow up questions. Okay, so we will stop here. Okay, we'll stop here. You did well actually. You did well, although there was a lot of prompts, but you did well. Yeah. So, uh, so I have a question, please. As a breast surgeon, I will face this kind of uh, yes. like hepatobiliary yes. uh, questions. Yes. Okay. You will be facing also. So the how the exam happens is so like forty five percentage to fifty percentage of the questions is general yeah. surgery and critical care. Okay. The rest in the rest 50 percent, you will be having uh, predominantly your specialty which comes in. OK, but within this general surgery, OK, this general surgery can include anything. It could be pancreatitis, yeah. pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cyst. For example, the last exam, not the one which is hap which is happening now, the last exam, the long case was the shoulder sarcoma. The long case patient was a shoulder sarcoma where you need to get <laughs> wow. yeah. so anything can be asked. OK, and yeah. as per the uh, syllabus, um, you as a candidate should have an ST6 level knowledge for upper GI and colorectal for HPB, I mean, even for HPB, I would say when I say upper GI, upper GI, HPB, colorectal, ST6 level knowledge is needed for all other areas of breast for a non breast trainee uh, transplant endocrine, you need to know up to the level of ST4. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Any questions so far? Right. So let me just finish off with a few slides for today. Uh, let me put that. Let me share my entire screen. Right. So, uh, means I, I hope you all had uh, some um, a taste of how the exam viva happens, OK? And this is just a, an overview about some basic scenarios, but there's lots and lots for you to uh, prepare, OK? So again, as I told, this taste of viva was, is planned and was conducted, and we plan for the next two weeks as a part of our fourth uh, course, which is about to commence on 11th June uh, for a period of three months, OK? Most of you in this group uh, would have registered for this course. Um, and for anyone who hasn't, uh, feel free to get in touch if you have any queries okay, uh, about this course and stuff. Okay, So how we do is it is a three-month course, okay, and we divide the whole um, curriculum into various scenarios or various modules. And every weekend we meet. and during every weekend the entire group of the we have a limit of 30 candidates we are not going to take more than that so the 30 uh hamsa can you mute your uh, mic please hamsa can you mute yours please thank you so every weekend um we will have one module okay and 30 candidates is our limit and this 30 candidates will be divided into three groups and each group will be allocated a mentor and we won't be teaching much but we will be putting scenarios, asking the candidates to answer, correcting them, and teach them. So this is the entire way of preparation for all the uh, subspecialties or the specialities, OK? So for example, if it is a general surgery, uh, a candidate means there will be three groups, there will be three faculties, and each group will go into 20 scenarios, OK? Um, and all these scenarios will be uh, recorded, and it will be available for you to review. So when you finish the general surgery module, um, a candidate would have participated or witnessed 20 scenarios uh, in a day 
made 40 scenarios in two days and will have recordings of further 30 or 40 scenarios for them to review. OK, uh, I can assure you that there won't be much of scenarios which could come in general surgery. The same thing we follow in upper GI surgery and HPB surgery. When it goes to the speciality, what happens is the speciality candidate will be separated and that speciality candidate will be sitting with the speciality faculty and the, he will be um, um, a wayward for like four hours or five hours for two days. And the other candidate will be asked scenarios on that particular speciality to a level where they are expected to know. OK, so that is how those things happen. And we have some special lectures now and then. So for example, for we have a separate lecture for academic paper interpretation. And usually, the colorectal trainees um, occupy more than 50 percentage of the group. So we tend to um, add an extra scenarios for them, uh, which is uh, like a symposium on a colorectal uh, scenarios. Um, and then we have a separate session for um, radiology as well. And the last, we have three weekends where we conduct mock exams exactly like how the actual exam happens. So we'll put a schedule and you come in at that particular time and um, it will be a one-on-one -on -one mock waiver and a feedback and the marks will be provided then and there. So each candidate will have a 40 minutes of general surgery waiver, 40 minutes of specialty waiver, 30 minutes of critical care, and 30 minutes of uh, academic and basic sciences, okay? So this is how our mock exam is conducted. Most importantly, two other things which I want to mention is we will have a close group um, a chat, which will be either in the WhatsApp or Telegram, where um, the candidates will have uh, access to the faculty continuously for three months. Um, and you can ask uh, various questions, doubts, and we will use that forum to uh, discuss and share the evidences and information. OK. Um, and similarly, we will share uh, our virtual library, which is, again, in the form of an LMS or a Google Drive, which we are still thinking because we have changed our brand now, uh, which will have everything that is required for a particular specialty, starting from guidelines, recent papers, uh, recent advances, and things at a revision means uh, reference textbooks, et cetera, which is required for clearing these exams. So again, as I told, um, we have quite a lot of registrations, but we will give preference to the September exam going people. And uh, host, those who cannot participate will be admitted as observers. I would also recommend this course for a section one candidates. OK, unfortunately, we don't have a section one course anywhere. And the reason being section one course is very, very vague. I would say section one is much, much difficult than section two. The reason being, although we have some standard question banks, none of the questions uh, uh, usually repeat in the actual exam. So, um, so whatever you prepare in the standard textbooks or in the um, uh, uh, online materials will give you an idea of how the questions are asked. But unlike MRCS, it doesn't give you the actual full syllabus which is required for the exam. So what is required for you is you need to build up your basic knowledge for clearing your Section 1 exam. So I generally recommend, and based on the feedback from the previous candidates, Section 1 exam goers can join this course as observers, and they can uh, observe the whole course in the same way, and then they can acquire knowledge on all these specialties. So this is what I want to tell. Um, thank you so much. And do you have any other questions? And this is just an overview about our first and the second course which we conducted. This is for the um, the September 2022 and Jan 2023 exams. This is the average amount of hours, accumulative hours, spent on various speciality, OK? So the first ex first course, we just had 12 candidates. In the second course, we had 17. And the third course, where the, the, the exams are being conducted next week, um, May 24th, we had 30 candidates. And if you see the, the cumulative duration of hours on each uh, speciality, this is the hours. And you will have access to the entire recording, for example, uh, this group had like 11 hours of uh, scenario recording on breast surgery, eight hours on transplant surgery, where you would have participated in one third of those and the other two thirds you can um, learn and revise through those uh, videos. So I can assure you that uh, definitely you don't need anything more than what we will be discussing in this uh, course. OK, and um, these are our uh, links, the website, um, our uh, social media handles. And we have a Telegram group where um, it is open to anyone. And anyone who has 
any uh, doubts or questions regarding FRCS exams, be it your international candidates or local candidates, um, you can um, text there and we are much, much happy to help and support. Okay. Thank you so much for the day. Yeah. Any questions? So far? Any questions? Anyone? No? Any feedback? Let me ask uh, uh, Mohamed Bargosh. How was it? It was great. Mm -hmm. well, it, it gave me that feeling that I'm not ready yet. So that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the problem. So when are you giving your exams? Uh, September. OK, fine, fine, fine. What about Hamza? Yeah, I mean, uh... Uh, it makes you less confident. I mean, it's you will face the truth that you need to walk more. So this is this is just a, uh, a like just to say I just touched. It's whatever you saw. So it's something like a a small tip of an iceberg of the scenarios. Okay, there are a lot many to prepare. Okay, again, it is impossible for you to go through all the textbooks and stuffs to gain your knowledge. The best way to prepare for the exams is going through scenarios where you participate. The most important thing is, as I told, you know, yeah. you will, you all have the knowledge of all these things, but how you answer at that particular point and what specific things are expected in the exam is the thing which you need to train yourself. Okay. Yeah. So that's good. But that, yeah, that you have, very, you have plenty of nice. time. Yeah. 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 I and uh, will, uh, be better. yes, uh, Sharanya, you want to add anything? Good experience good. So others, many of you haven't uh, switched on your camera even. Okay. I hope in the next two sessions probably you can uh, volunteer yourself. Okay. Don't feel bad. Okay. And whatever way I question here is not to uh, irritate you or make you feel stressed, but this is exactly how in the exam the examiners will irritate you. Okay, so there are certain examiners who are very, very cool and they will help you and guide you, but there are often very difficult examiners who will try to pull you down with every response. Okay, so so so, so you need to be uh, you need to develop the habit of handling this various. Um, uh, uh, kind of examiners, uh, and uh, of course, means it means people who has participated in the course. You will know how different people react. Okay, so that's that's again an important thing where you need to practice with different group of people on different topics. Okay, you need to have a cool person. You need to have a very very harsh person. You need to have a colleague you can help and give so many prompts. So you need to have a lot of practice in very with dealing with different people. Okay, that will make you a strong um, person, actually. Okay, good. Just one question, please. Yes. Uh, the 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 one that we will do for hepatobiliary, uh, it's mm -hmm. only designed for hepatobiliary trainee, or any trainee. No, no, no. So that's what I told. So if it is HPB on a particular weekend, okay, there will be a where the HPB trainees will be in that room with the HPB faculty. And for them, yeah. the depth of discussion will be in deep. Okay, they'll be discussing about all the trials, all the recent evidences and stuff, which will be equivalent to an ST8 level. But a non-HPB trainee will be in a general group where a HPB faculty will come and ask you this common scenarios, which is expected for you in HPB. And again, the depth of discussion won't be unnecessarily into trials and evidences. You will be just discussing to a level which is expected in the exam. Same thing Thank with endocrine surgery, same with vascular surgery, everything. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Henry, you have any question? Yeah, you said there was a telegram group. How do we, is there a link for that or how do we get that? So I will, I will put it up in the, means I think it's there in the chat group, but what I will do is uh, you can click that link and you can join in the telegram group or I will share in the group, okay? And then you can join. Okay. And then the other question I had was um, this session, do we have um, access to this recording of today's yes. session? So what I'm so, oh yeah, this I should have told at the beginning. So I have recorded this session, okay? And this session will be in the YouTube, 
channel of Prep Medico. Okay. I hope uh, you people won't have problems with that. Okay. If you have any problems, you let me know. And again, it's just purely for academic purpose. Okay. Purely for academic purpose. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, let's meet for the. So, uh, Alia Aishak, you have any question? No, it, it was very informative and it will give you a chance to speak up and see how you are trapped and how you can answer. So it was a very good experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So do share uh, this free sessions with your friends and colleagues, whoever wants to have a feel of how is it. And also do, I mean, people who, who are interested to join the course, do text me or text the, I mean, there are, there are contact people in the group to check how it is. Uh, and we can help you and guide you on this and do recommend to your friends as well. OK, good. All right, then. Thank you so much for the day. And we will meet next week. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.